that would be great. That was your job, Hamish. Okay. Sorry about that, Susan. Thank you. Okay, so I start off um, talking about what's 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 pretty topical at the moment, and that um, that's the the Russian um, invasion of the Ukraine and what that means for our dairy markets. We're certainly seeing a, a, a spike in uncertainty and in, in volatility um, as a result of that, um, and we're starting to see you know a lot of assessment. Um, what what that actually means. So the last time we saw a big spike in volatility was back in the global financial crisis, and then um, again at the start of pandemic, and, and we're now seeing sort of a, another period of um, uncertainty. So um, what what it's really happening is that the um, trends that were already in place prior um, prior to the invasion um, have have sort of become intensified. So we already had high commodity prices, we had high um, oil. Prices, we had energy shortages, and, and that's been been intensified. Um, but there is also a longer term impact around um, global economic growth. So Russia isn't a, um, a major trading partner um, for New Zealand um, any longer. Um, it certainly has been one of you know once upon a time it was our biggest market for for butter. Um, now it sits about 30th on the list in terms of um, export partners and, and we sell um, less than half a percent of our exports um, in general go to Russia um, and it is mainly that sort of butter, milk, fat and we sell a little bit of um, wine and apples and kiwi fruit up there as well but, but certainly not um, a, a major partner for us so that most of the impacts on us are sort of indirect rather, um, rather than direct um, impacts. So Russia is a big supplier of oil to the world, um, and they're also a, a major supplier of gas um, into um, directly into Europe. So, majority of um, the gas used in Germany um, comes from a pipeline directly directly from Russia. Um, so, what we have seen is a spike in oil prices. So, oil prices we have gone up back over a hundred dollars um, a barrel, US dollars a barrel again. Um, and that um, we're starting to see, already seen that um, in the fuel prices at the pumps here. Um, and we're also those high energy prices um, and the high gas prices particularly are also sort of responsible for some of those high fertilizer prices that we're seeing here in, here in um, locally. Um, the synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, um, uh, they use a lot of gas to produce, um, produce those fertilizers. So that's really one of the reasons that we're seeing such um, high prices uh, for, for nitrogen fertilizers, um, not such a direct impact on, on the rock fertilizers, the phosphates and the like, um, but certainly seeing that spike in prices um, in, in general for fertilizer. Um, so we're also, the other, the other um, way we'll see a big impact to, um, out of that region is the fact that um, the Ukraine and um, Russia are, are massive producers of um, wheat um, and corn. So more than a quarter of the world's wheat that's exported um, comes out of those two countries um, with, with Ukraine um, exporting, also exporting and supplying a, a big portion of corn. So we're seeing um, as a result um, in the last day or so, we've seen wheat prices spike. They've gone over 10 um, US dollars a bushel. Um, and that's, uh, that's going to really push up the price of feeding um, livestock that are that are, have a grain-based diet, so you know where where dairy cattle are housed, which is across most of the world, um, that's going to push up their their feed prices um, as well. Um, so the um, here I've just just showing the the price of um, um, urea, the wholesale price in, in China, because we do buy a lot of our um, urea out of China as well. But we've seen that really trending up for the past um, sort of couple of years, really. Um, and you know, these are wholesale prices, not um, not the price we get to pay as farmers. But um, we've seen that you know big lift in prices, and it's all really being driven by um, just the, the tighter energy um, supplies um, and, the, and the slowing down of, um, uh, we're trying to slow down a number of factories at, at different times in order to um, sort of reduce their pollution. So they, they, um, they're having um, some big environmental challenges and um, you know, one of the quick fixes, and um, particularly leading up to the Beijing Olympics was to simply shut down um, production in, um, in some regions. 
So we have seen, you know, we are seeing those high prices and it doesn't look like those high prices are going to disappear um, anytime soon as well. The other area that's been impacting um, and has really been um, a pandemic related issue is the, is the high price of um, shipping goods around, around the world. Now um, I've got showing three different lines on this graph and the paler line is the, is the Baltic um, dry index. It's kind of one that a lot of people hear about and, and it's sort of considered a um, lead indicator of, of economic growth. Um, we have seen that one drop away and so that does indicate there may be some um, pressure coming off some of the shipping of the of the on those big um, on those big ships that just carry everything in the hull. Um, but the container ships, which the other two lines um, show show the costs of, um, they they haven't come back. Um, sort of before Christmas, we thought we might see a little bit of relief. Um, in that front, but it has continued to be a problem and we're just starting to hear um, even more issues with, with freight um, and containers. And then of course, you know, we've got the um, outbreak of, of COVID locally and that's just starting to, um, starting to play a bit of havoc with some of our supply chain. And so uh, I think New Zealand couriers have just issued a notice in Auckland and Hamilton that they're only taking sort of um, urgent goods um, and there'll be big delays in getting um, product moved around. So yeah, those, those sort of logistical challenges look like they're going to be here um, for at least another sort of six months or so um, and, and possibly longer. Um, and all, all of this is sort of driving to, you know, much, um, a lot of inflation around the world and much, much higher prices, so particularly in the, in the New Zealand um, and the US where both, both countries are experiencing really, really high inflation. Um, inflation levels are a little bit less than in some other places, parts of Europe, Asia and, and, um, and even Australia. But certainly New Zealand um, and the US have got really rampant um, inflation at the moment. And so the central banks um, in both, both those countries um, are looking at ways that they can kind of keep inflation under control. And, and their main tool to do that is to um, increase the official cash rate. So we've already seen the Reserve Bank here move you know, rates up to, up to 1% um, locally. And our expectation is that rates will continue to move up and, and be at 3% by, um, by the middle of next year. So another sort of um, two full percentage point um, increases um, and sort of 25 basis point um, increments over, over the next sort of 18 months or so. Uh, you know, we haven't seen inflation at these sort of levels for, uh, for a very long time. Um, and it, it certainly, you know, we, I mean, I think we're all feeling it um, and the prices that we're paying, whether it be um, some really obvious ones like fuel and fertilizer, um, but also um, particularly um, in the, you know, in the labor market, wages are, wages are rising um, and, you know, the labor market's really, really tight. So, you know, once we see those sort of prices um, lift, it's a little bit self-fulfilling as well. So we sort of keep getting into a bit of an upward spiral in terms of inflation. So the Reserve Bank certainly got quite a big job ahead of it to sort of try and rein in that inflation, which basically translates to higher interest rates um, for, for us. Um, so here you can kind of see inflation around the world um, is, is growing at different rates, but we're sort of leading the pack at the moment. Um, we're sort of expecting our inflation to peak at over 6% um, either this quarter or, or next quarter. Um, and um, yeah, and be reasonably persistent um, until we start to see those, um, eventually start to see um, a, a little bit of slowdown. Um, so world economic growth um, has sort of bounced back um, a little. We've, we're seeing different rates of growth in different countries. Um, throughout the pandemic, most of the developed world um, supported their economies um, in ways a little bit similar to what we did here with wage subsidies and, and, and those sort of, that sort of support um, and also lowered official cash rates, put more money into the, into the system. Um, basically you know made it they loosened monetary conditions and um, we also had more government spending and that really sort of supported their economy so while they had a dip in 2020 most of them sort of had quite a good recovery last year and then attending to slow down a little bit again this year 
um, in the sort of the more developing worlds, Asia and um, parts of the Middle East, um, they didn't, you know, didn't have the money to sort of support their economies um, through COVID to the same degree. Their vaccination rates are running much, much further behind. So they, they really slowed down last year. Um, but are generally sort of bouncing back up again their growth rates, um, their growth rates this year. But um, you know the likes of China is is sort of growing at around six percent annually now, whereas you know a few years back we had sort of double figure growth um, coming coming out of that region. Um, but we do have a sort of challenge with this inflation growing so quickly and 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 sort of outpacing um, economic growth in in some regions. Um, in terms of Susan, I've just got a question on um, the um, commodity prices in general. Yeah. Sorry. Um, where do you see this? This is a general question for New Zealand. Where do you see inflation, or two parts? What's driven inflation so far, and where do you see it heading? Given that um, obviously the Reserve Bank will try and lift interest rates to counterbalance it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what, what started to sort of drive the inflation in the first place was, was really um, tight um, well, restrictions and supply chains really globally, um, basically slow down in, in, in manufacturing in some regions, um, yet we had all these economies that sort of being stimulated stimulated by government support and, and therefore a lot of spending by consumers and a lot of spending on goods. So that's um, really pushed up that demand for goods and pushed up inflation. So people sort of move their spending from services, so going out to dinner and going on holiday to into material goods. And it, that, that's what's sort of pushed up the price of, of those, those goods. Um, and then, you know, as we've sort of um, moved through the pandemic, we're, we're sort of starting to see different different factors. I mean, here, our labour market's very restricted um, in terms of, you know, the borders being closed and people not being able to come into the country. And yet we've still had this really quite strong growth last year and quite strong demand for labour. So that's really pushed up the prices there in terms of wages. So that's more of a, more of a local factor and, and a factor that tends to be quite sticky. So we don't tend to see, like, if you get a wage increase you're not going to kind of go next month and say oh okay you know we'll, we'll I'll accept a, a lower wage that, that this month you know once they sort of move out they they stay there um so it's going to be it is quite a task for the reserve bank to try and try and rein it in um and so inflation is likely to be outside they, they try and run it in a band of sort of one to three percent inflation like we're running at basically double the top of the band at the moment um, so it's likely to take them you know quite some time to to rein that back in but it really just sort of depends um, how quickly um, they go with with the likes of interest rate rises and also how the economy um, how the economy performs as well because there you know there's some parts of the economy are quite fragile and we're certainly starting to see a, 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 a I guess a a fall in confidence in, in some businesses, um, particularly with cost rising and challenges. So we we could see things slow down quite quickly if um, if they go a little bit too hard as well, um, and, and with, with global economic situation. So it's it's really hard. It's a really hard um, balancing act, but the sort of face between, um, yeah, with this with that with where inflation is where it's at, they really are sort of forced to do something and do something reasonably quickly. So if I carry on in terms of um, commodity prices um, in general, this is our ANZ Commodity Price Index, which sort of covers all of our main export sectors, um, but weighted by our exports. So dairy certainly um, as, a, as a leading factor in this. We've seen, you know, um, the prices really lift. Um, this is in New Zealand dollar terms. And at the moment, what we are also seeing is um, strong, um, the, the, the lower New Zealand dollar is also helping the prices that we're getting back at the farm gate. So what you normally see is that the New Zealand dollar will go up when commodity prices are strong. So they kind of offset each other um, to some degree. But at the moment, we're sort of getting the benefit from both, um, both high commodity prices um, and a lower New Zealand dollar. And that, um, that lower New Zealand dollar um, has, has sort of been driven by 
global uncertainty, volatility, we consider sort of a risk currency. So when there's um, when there's a lot of risk happening in the world and a lot of uncertainty, then our dollar tends to tends to fall. Um, when there's more certainty, then we'll see see a lift in our dollar. So that, that sort of that sort of general factor is what sort of helped to keep it um, um, at a lower value than where it may have been, say, um, if commodity prices were where they are now without sort of the, the bigger wider economic risk that we're seeing from the pandemic and then things like the um, Russia and Ukraine um, issue as well. Um, we do expect to see by, um, by the end of this year, the dollar back to about 72 um, US cents, um, but it, it certainly has um, sort of stayed, stayed a bit lower, a bit longer than we had um, initially expected um, and that you know that plays into higher milk prices basically at the farm gate level. So in terms of um, the um, debt that we have in, um, in the agriculture sector in general, this is debt across um, across New Zealand, across all banks, not just not just ANZ. Um, but what we have seen in the in the last few years is the total debt levels have been relatively stable. They've come back a, a weenie bit, but what we've really seen is a, a change in how that's made up. So we've seen um, a reasonable decrease in, in dairy debt, and, and that's really been um, driven mainly by people um, paying off um, principal um, on on existing lending there certainly has been been um, new lending as well but we've just seen an increased rate of, of paying back um, that debt which um, in a lot of cases was was really warranted to to sort of make their um, their businesses a little bit more financially um, sustainable and you know in those high that we've had you know a couple of years of high milk prices and that's really helped um, people be able to pay down debt that they had accumulated the sheep and beef sector sort of grown a little but um, and we have seen quite a sharp lift um, in, in horticulture lending, um, but that's off a really really low base. So um, yeah, most of the, for most banks, um, most of their exposure is still very much in the in the dairy sector um, when you're talking about um, about agriculture um, in general. Um, if we look wider than just the agriculture sector, um, looking across. Um, Total debt in New Zealand, we've had um, quite a lift in um, government debt, um, and that's when they borrowed money basically to stimulate the economy throughout the pandemic. Um, we also saw, um, particularly last year and the year before, a lift in um, um, borrowing for, for houses. Um, now that's kind of slowed down and, and, and come, to a, come to a bit of a halt, but we saw those, you know, that house prices kept going up and people kept buying. Um, even though they were getting pretty expensive. Um, so that's really, that's pushed up. The, there is more debt now sitting in that sort of personal um, housing debt section. Um, and then business and agriculture debt stayed um, relatively, um, relatively stable, came back, um, came back um, a little bit. Um, and then I thought I'd just touch on, um, touch on where we've seen things going with, with the carbon price. Um, so this is, a, this is the price um, that carbon um, trades at or, or those involved in the ETS basically have to, have to pay the price um, to, to, um, to admit um, carbon. Now we have seen um, this price really skyrocket up over the last um, couple of years. Um, it did actually go up to about $85 a tonne and then it's come back to around about 80 um, at the moment. There has, um, if we if we look at it glo um, compared to some other markets, we're certainly um, our carbon prices aren't as high as what they are in the EU, but they're certainly a lot higher than um, a lot of other markets around the world. Um, there has been some talk around um, changing accounting principles and things, so we could eventually have sort of a global carbon market um, that's likely to take quite some time um, to to develop. Um, but if if we did, we can see that we're sort of um, our pricing is, is sort of reasonably high up in there at the moment. Um, there aren't a lot of like real good forward indicators of where the carbon price is likely to go. Um, one, I mean, one of the reasons it shot up so so dramatically was that up until um, about um, May last year, uh, the the price uh, people who were in, who um, had to pay for their emissions could just pay a set price to the government. 
um, for emissions. Um, and now that, that that option has been taken away and you actually have to buy credits in the market. So when, when that happened, we started to see sort of a, like a true market for carbon exist. And we, we did see the prices absolutely um, skyrocket. Um, now, the, I was looking at the market um, recently and I did write a paper about this as well, but um, there is a lot of units in circulation. So depending on what happens with those units going forward, we may not necessarily see that carbon price um, always trend upwards. Um, there, I mean, over the longer term, it, it should actually trend right back down around to zero once it's, it's, it's pretty much done its job. Um, but there is, you know, there is sort of been this expectation that it will keep trending up. But um, there is, yeah, there's a lot of holdings out there. Some of them will be needed for, for um, they're held by forestry companies. And they will need to repay them when that when they um, fell their forest. I think we've just lost a bit of internet. going forward, but the way it's moved so quickly, we can see why um, there has sort of been a bit of a preference to um, price methane separately to carbon um, as part of the, um, the proposals that are currently being, um, being put forward. Um, in terms of um, looking at um, sorry, just, market prices. I've just got a question on the carbon, if you can just go back. One slide, please. Yeah. Um, how do you see um, the the methane pricing mechanism play out in New Zealand? Obviously, that's um, you know coming fairly rapidly. To so there's sort of two parts to it. How do you think the mechanism will play out, and what do you think the pricing um, discount or the the price to farmers? Do you think that will stay quite low or do you think it will rise quite quickly because potentially it could be a huge yeah, I, cost to farmers but it, there's a lot of uncertainty there I guess yeah yeah there is and it um the way I kind of look at it I see it um particularly if if the um the Hiwaka Ekanoa proposals go through um I mean if, if it's if it's left how it currently is and it's part of the ATS and it's going to be linked to this this carbon price if it's under the other systems um, proposed, then um, it won't be. That's that we get the opportunity to to price methane separately. Um, the action, I mean, it's basically going to be a tool that can be used to try to reduce our methane emissions down to the level that we need them to be. Um, where it ends up being priced at, I think, will depend really how quickly we are reducing emissions. Anyway, if we if we all kind of don't do anything and ignore everything, well, then there's a chance that that will get cranked up. You know, it will have to crank up reasonably quickly to actually um, start to start to make a difference. But if we can all actually make some changes that do do um, reduce emissions. Um, we can look for new technologies, we can work out on our farms, how we can farm in a way that, um, you know, just, uh, basically how we're managing our farms um, can be more, I guess, more efficient in terms of producing less methane relative to, to the milk we're producing, then, you know, maybe the price doesn't go as high, it doesn't have um, as big an impact. Um, but I think in general, like we've got these sort of pricings coming forward, we're getting more variability um, in the prices that we're getting paid for our milk, depending on what we're doing on farm and how we're doing things. We're going to see a much bigger variation in profit, you know, profitability levels on, on farms in general. Um, so that provides some opportunities um, for those who are doing a really good job, um, but it is going to create, you know, some challenges um, if, if you're, you know, if your profitability is already relatively low and you're not able to sort of do anything easily um, to improve your profitability or to reduce your methane levels, then it's going to become really, really challenging for, for, for some oper operators. Um, but I do think we'll, you know, we're going to go through a period of, of um, quite a lot of change um, quite rapidly um, as we all get our heads around, around, these, around these changes. But I do also think there is the opportunity at the other end that we're seeing um, 
it's an opportunity to sort of get higher returns in the market too, because we've, we've now sort of, it's going to mean we're going to have all the sort of paperwork that our consumers and our, and our customers are looking for in the, in the markets to, to prove our sort of environmental credentials as well. And at the moment, that sort of money being left on the table that we're not necessarily um, achieving. So, yeah, opportunities. So, and just, just in line with that, um, a question that I got asked today, um, so, um, you know, how you're saying that the pricing mechanism will be relative to the emissions um, changes that the industry makes. Um, given that uh, the government has poured a whole lot of money into Air New Zealand to keep them afloat and the planes are all about to start flying again, do you see the same thing happening effectively, I suppose, with government intervention coming in via the ETS into the transport sector? Um, and in and, and what way do, do you mean? Well, I guess, of... I guess what farmers are saying is they're, they're getting a pricing mechanism driving, which is going to keep going up until they drop their emissions appropriately to targets. Yeah. Effectively, farmers are saying, is the same thing going to happen in the transport industry, including airlines, but obviously through fuel, where the price of fuel just keeps going up until the emissions, because at the moment, the way farmers understand it is a lot of the transport industry is not really reducing their emissions, they're actually just planting trees to offset. So yeah, is it yeah. actually going to change I'm, that yeah. they're going to stop planting trees, they're actually going to start reducing their emissions? And I suppose the, the yeah. real um, thing that's happening as well at the moment is, you know, Air New Zealand's about to start a whole lot more flights and a whole lot more emissions. So how is that going to actually play out in the emissions pricing scene, sort of? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, in terms of the sort of the, the fuel, the fuel, um, there is a basically an ATS charge is already included in the fuel that um, that everyone is is paying. But yeah, that um, that could potentially increase over time and there's you know some industries have been given free credits as well um, in terms of the ETS um, and they will likely um, de decrease um, somewhat over time. Um, there is it's sort of um, I guess there is emission budgets that the government sort of sets in, in relation to um, in conjunction with the um, Climate Change Commission um they in theory the number of units that are sort of released into the market um should be aligned with with the, those budgets and and then pretty much the carbon price becomes the mechanism that um that that um i guess allocates um allocates those um it's yeah i, I mean i think you've got all those you know all sectors um are paying the part somewhat but at the moment the likes of Air New Zealand and, and BP and companies like that if they want to they can just offset all their emissions by um by basically planting trees still becoming involved um and in, in tree planting um I do think there will be some regulatory changes at some point that will limit their ability to do that they, they will be able to offset some of their emissions that way but not 100% of their emissions because that's um yeah we're quite unusual in New Zealand that we, we're allowing that and it's you know it doesn't necessarily um sort of achieve the goals we want to just by simply trying to plant your way out of it um and I I think that realisation is is there and I do think we will see some re regulatory changes. I just don't know how quickly um, that will happen. Yeah, that's good. Right, I'll move, I'll move on. So in terms of um, dairy prices, um, we've got our farm gate um, milk price forecast. Um, I updated my forecast a month ago and um, the way the market's been moving is they, they get pretty... I feel like they get out of date pretty um, pretty quickly. So um, forecast at the moment for, for the current season is, um, is $9.30, but certainly where we've seen the dairy com um, the GDT prices go in about the last three auctions or so since I did those forecasts, um, we have, there, there certainly is some upside, um, upside risk on that forecast um, at present. 
Um, looking out to next season, um, I'm forecasting $8.40 um, per kg of milk solids. Now, um, looking out that far and you kind of see on that top right graph, I have sort of discounted the price of where um, dairy futures um, are sitting um, to, get, to get back to that level. Uh, and if I just sort of looked today at where um, dairy futures prices were for the likes of whole milk powder um, and butter and, um, and, and then sort of took a position on where the dollar's going to be based on sort of normal hedging policy and where it's, where it's been in the past, um, it would certainly be higher than that $8.40 um, level. Um, what, what I am a little bit concerned about in, in the global markets um, is, is the demand side of the equation. We're certainly not seeing a lot of milk around the world at the moment. And um, the latest figures out of the US show um, they're slowing um, reasonably, um, well, the, the, a, a reasonable slowdown there. Um, and that has sort of been the market ha that had the greatest potential to kind of add extra milk into, into the global markets. Um, we're seeing a little bit of growth in, in Europe, but very minimal. Um, we're slowing here in New Zealand. Um, and then um, not a lot of growth kind of coming out of those secondary markets as well, like Australia and Argentina and Uruguay. So certainly on the milk supply side, it's, it's quite tight. Um, but on the demand side, we, I mean, we do typically see some erosion of demand for dairy products once home milk powder gets over $4,000 a tonne. Um, it does get incredibly expensive for um, consumers in some of the in some of the poorer nations, um, particularly Middle East, North Africa, um, or Africa in general, and, and some parts of Asia. Th those prices are are very hard to um, very hard for consumers to manage. Um, and then, of course, on top of these prices, you know, there's also transport costs which are, um, have skyrocketed as well. So. Dairy products are really expensive in market at the moment. And while we're seeing those markets still buying at the moment, I do, it, it, I do have some concerns that that may not, um, may not last forever. And we have also seen, um, probably in the last few years, we have seen um, China in generally, but generally building stocks a little in terms of um, their agriculture imports um, in general. They've become more and more reliant in the last, uh, sort of decade on, on imported food um, and, and certainly a couple of years ago they, they sort of started to um, try and build some additional stocks to avoid risks of, of supply challenges going forward. Um, now if those um, if we do sort of see supply chain issues um, improve over time and, and things we may start to see some of those stocks um, levels being reduced back a little bit as well and that, that might just sort of trigger prices to come back. Um, a little as well, so I, I'm certainly on on the um, on the sort of more uh, probably more gloomy outlook um, of all, all the sort of the dairy commentators out there at the moment. Um, but it's um, but yeah, um, forecasting an eight dollar forty milk price and telling and saying that that's at the gloomy end is kind of a, um, a, an unusual position to be in with with prices so high um, at the moment. Um, and you know, prices have been. We think we're seeing strength across sort of virtually um, all parts of the dairy complex. Um, so that means you know we're seeing the milk fat prices are high at the moment. We're also seeing um, you know really really solid demand uh, for milk powders. Um, cheese prices are strong, so it, it's pretty consistent um, right um, right across all all aspects um, of dairy. So yeah, the the immediate term solid. Um, not not quite so sure about the slightly slightly longer um, longer longer term, but um, certainly not expecting you know a big dip um, in pricing um, like we had when um, the European Union took their their um, quotas off and we had that big surge in um, global global milk supply. So yeah, in terms of um, our own production um, season here. And we've certainly been trending down a little bit this, se like this season, right? Um, pretty much every month has been, we've been back a bit. It hasn't been the easiest season for, um, for, for a lot of regions um, across New Zealand. And, and um, we're very unlikely to sort of match the, the autumn that we had last year when, when we had um, really strong production. Um, so expecting to end the season probably about four and a half percent down on last season. 
um, across New Zealand as a whole. Um, and, and yeah, I think it was only a week or two back we saw Frontera vice down their own milk production forecast for this year. And I think they were talking about 3.8% back. So yeah, we're all kind of in, in reasonable in line with each other. Um, and you know, that, that certainly that news that milk is, um, is tracking behind in New Zealand as you know, is that is another one of those reasons that is pushing up. Major dairy exporters, not necessarily major producers, and um, we don't include the likes. of um, China and Russia, which right. So I just lose you all. And we back, is that good? Yes, you are back. Thank you. Cool. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, we have seen this, um, we are seeing this um, slowdown in milk production here. The last time we saw a milk production slow was back and um, after the um, after milk quotas were taken off in Europe and, and we saw that initially that big surge in production and then we saw the sort of opposite effect and we saw um, a big slowdown in production. So, um, the, I mean, it's really this, this sort of slowdown in milk at the moment that is, um, is you know, supporting the prices that we're, we're currently seeing. In terms of um, what we're seeing driving commodity prices, I guess, um, in, in the shorter term and um, in the longer term, um, in the short term, we've seen this, you know, the re reduced production, it's quite evident in the, in the dairy markets. Um, we've, we're sort of seeing that um, political instability, which has really pushed up prices of, of some commodities like, um, um, like oil and, and our grains. Um, and we've also seen those supply chain issues, meaning people willing to hold bigger stocks, which has pushed up, um, pushed up demand in the, in the short term. Over the longer term, um, you know, the supply is going to be more constrained by around um, the availability of, of, of land and water uh, for, for dairy production and, and for production of agriculture in general. Um, not, not, not a major issue in New Zealand, but other parts of the world are starting to really struggle with um, supplying enough water for, for crops. Um, we're starting to see increased accounting for environmental costs, so whether that's paying for water or paying um, the cost of um, nutrient emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, or, or paying for the cost of, of ways to, to mitigate the, those um, issues. And, and that's not just a New Zealand um, issue, certainly on the nutrient side, we're seeing you know, increased regulation in, in a lot of markets, um, um, particularly like Europe um, and, the, and the US. Um, we will see some productivity gains going, going forward and, um, and, and reduced wastage of, of food in general. Um, and certainly the long-term supply will be driven by, by profitability. If, if, if um, farmers are making profits, then we'll see increased, increased supply. In terms of the, the demand, um, the, you know, the longer term factors are really driven by population growth and income growth. And that's where we're seeing that sort of income growth is really what's enabling um, Asian markets to buy a lot more dairy products um, than they have done, done previously because they've now got enough, a, a much greater number of people have got enough income to actually go to the supermarket and, and buy products. Um, and we're also seeing you know, this trend towards consumer choices. People are much more sort of um, fussy and much more informed about um, what they're spending their money on, whether that be clothing or whether that be food. And um, I think that trend's only going to grow. It's, it's certainly a much more prominent trend in the, in the younger generation. Um, and as those people um, grow up and become the main consumers, um, that trend's only going to become more and more entrenched. Um, 
so that's that's something that we can see as a um, an opportunity um, going going forward is tapping into those um, the the sort of consumer choice um, mindset. So in um, in terms of thinking about um, our dairy farms and our our or protein production systems in general, I mean I, I think you know what we've got basically is we're using you know land um, and water. Um, to produce pasture, um, to which we then feed to our cows and, and produce milk. Um, the other inputs we're using a, a, a labour, um, fertiliser, um, supplementary feed. Um, and, and I think, you know, over, over time, what we have seen is an increased use of um, more, um, more imported um, labour, fertiliser and, and feed. Um, and that, that's sort of a trend that's been, been evident for, for a while. Um, and on the output side, you know, we're producing um, milk, meat, um, and um, we need some calves, but we don't. We don't need um, probably as many as we as we have. And then we have these other externalities, um, nutrients um, through our through our effluent, um, our greenhouse gas emissions. So so looking forward, you know, we, we're starting to have to think a little bit wider around our our, our systems um, in terms of. How can we produce um, as much um, milk and meat, um, particularly in beef farms, um, as, as possible? With, but limiting, you know, the negative externalities. You know, finding ways to to limit the excess carbs um, coming through the systems. Looking at ways to manage those nutrient emissions um, and our greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, we are going to see our farms continually to evolve over time. Um, as we're starting to price in some of these other other factors, um, but I think on the you know the upside, what you know what we do see is it, it, by the work we're doing on farms um, at the moment in terms of um, improving our um, uh, improving our farms to be more um, environmentally sustainable. And the paperwork that we're doing with that does, you know, provide an opportunity to then, you know, supply that information to markets and actually receive um, a greater premium or a premium on a greater portion of the product that we're selling um, by being able to provide what those customers want or what and what their customers want. Um, it, it's sort of always been a fact, I think, that we've, we've left a lot of value on the table um, that people just don't necessarily um, understand they they like what we do but they don't necessarily it hasn't necessarily been linked um, fully into our our marketing of our product of our products and really you know really telling that story of how how we farm because I think what you know a lot of what we're already doing is just absolutely loved by consumers um, and sure we will have to continue to evolve our farms but we are sort of setting ourselves up for I think a really um, a really strong future um, in in the global markets by um, improving our environmental footprints as well. So um, I won't leave it on that side too long. All the numbers all just um, um, bore you to death. But um, into I'm pretty much reached the end of my um, presentation. So happy to um, open up for any um, any questions. Thanks very much, Susan. That's um, there's some hope, I think, in that in that presentation for us. Um, there's a few quite good questions here, and I've had um, a couple of others today too. So if we start with um, Steve's one, which was was the back when you were talking about the the New Zealand dollar, um, does the lower New Zealand dollar drive inflation here? Oh, that's a, um, that that's a really good um, that's a really good question. Um, I don't necessarily I don't necessarily think um, a lower dollar um, drives inflation um, as such. Um, I'm guessing it means I mean, through import prices. Yeah, so our import prices are actually more expensive. They are more expensive when the New Zealand dollar. Um, as low, um, there, there's no doubt about that. Um, but then our export returns are, are better, so we sort of go, you know, 
it, it helps on ones that it, you know what it what it in theory should do if we've got a lower dollar and our import prices are higher it should reduce the amount of, of product that we're we're importing um, I don't know necessarily think it has a bit of a a direct impact on on inflation, but um, probably some of my other colleagues in my economics team will have a better understanding of that relationship. So if we if I get a better answer from from anyone, I'll get it, I'll get it sent through to you. But um, yeah, I don't think it has a major major direct impact. Okay, thank you. Um, now one from Taffy. Banks are more shy to lend to farming, particularly new lending. Um, what is influencing these changes and how can farmers mitigate this? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I mean I, banks look at sort of every deal individually and, and look to assess, um, assess the risk. Um, I mean, obviously on any new deals to bank, it's, um, there's no sort of proven track record so much um, to assess on. So that, you know, that um, new lending in general is, tends to be um, a little bit more, more challenging. Um, if we go back like a year, a year or two, we, there was some um, regulatory changes and it was making it look like we could be quite um, short of, of funds available for lending in general. Um, and there was um, there was quite a fear that that would reduce the amount of lending that was going to be available for the agriculture sector in general. So I think banks at that point, a, a lot of banks did sort of look a little bit um, at looking after their existing customers, making sure that they had the funding available for existing customers, and, and making sure they you know did did right by by then. Um, but I wouldn't say there's ever sort of been a you know. Um, any sort of major um, major policy change, it's it, it's it's very obvious that the dairy sector has become overly indebted um, over the years, um, and so there has been a sort of a move to try and you know improve um, um, improve debt repayment levels and, and get you know farms set up well um, financially, so they are really a lot more sustainable and able to sort of you know manage any risks that. That do get thrown your way that you don't know are going to come. So there has certainly been a push, I think, in general um, from banks um, towards that over time. Um, but certainly, I know you know we've, there's been plenty of um, new you know new to bank lending deals being being done. But you know every every deal is individual um, and it has to be assessed on on its risk. But I, I guess you know. The more proven track record people have and the more understanding of, of um, the process and the more data and information they can sort of bring to the table, um, the more, more it helps the process in general. Just along those lines, can you make some comments on how the bank views the risk of horticulture, given that there's quite a bit of um, land use change and um, a lot of pastoral farmers are now looking at, you know, um, areas of high value soils and, and I guess diversifying their farming systems into horticulture. Um, how does the bank view the risk on things like kiwi fruit, given that you know the, the size of the investment is huge and to, I guess you know it's a one product, quite a risky market. Can you give us the bank's view on the lending into those type of um, investments? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess, um, you know, one of the reasons when I put that graph up earlier that the horticulture lending was, you know, is, is relatively low um, or the debt in, in horticulture in general is relatively low is because it is generally a, a riskier sector than, than you know, um, than other types of, of farming. Um, you, you're very much reliant on sort of one crop um, and yeah, it, it has been, it is, it is challenging. It, it's probably a little bit easier in the horticulture sectors that are really, really well established um, and where there's quite a lot of certainty around pricing going forward. So the likes of kiwi fruit um, certainly is a little bit easier to lend to um, than, than say some other, other sectors. Um, but I, I think what we've also seen too in, in the kiwi fruit sector um, in recent years is that a lot of that um, a lot of that development um, and borrowing has come from existing operators too with, with proven track yep. records as opposed to um, new oh. new people getting into the sector. Um, it's I mean it's it's like anything you know um, 
if you haven't dairy farmed before, your first year is going to be challenging. You know, <laughs> there's a lot to learn, um, and it's the same with the same with any sector. So I think you know what we are generally seeing is a lot of that. Well, certainly. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the licenses that Desperies granted in recent years have gone to existing operators um, rather rather than new operators. So, you know, in a lot of cases, they um, they might be taking on quite a lot of debt, but they're spreading it over quite a big asset that they that they already have as well. Um, yeah. So it's a little um, a little bit um, a little bit different as as well. Yeah, fair call. Um, Terence, do you want to ask your question? personally and then if you want to open it up to the floor uh, yep I've just got to find it um, okay uh, so we, you talked tonight Susan around a lot of the limitations around production and that's environmental you know greenhouse gas gases the impacts that that's having or potentially is going to have in New Zealand, but also internationally. And from my point of view as a farmer, that tells me that production is going to drop at this stage uh, until technologies come in. And yet here we are with increasing demand <clears throat> through uh, an increase in population and increasing wealth. Why then going forward uh, are the uh, commodity prices um, predictions quite conservative? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's there's always a price people are willing to pay, and um, and certainly it's easier to get higher prices when you've got less product to sell. So if you know if milk if milk does come back a little bit in New Zealand, then we potentially have we can be a little bit more choosy in which markets we sell to and target more of our product into that um, into that higher end market. Um, I do think there are consumers that won't, you know, going forward won't um, be able to afford the higher priced um, genuinely produced milk. We will see more synthetic proteins come in and into the market and, and probably fill that sort of bottom end of, of the market because the growth, yeah, when you kind of look at population growth um, and trying to feed everyone, um, we're going to have to do it a lot more efficiently than what we have done um, who we have done so far. So I think in, in general, we will see you know, a reduction in um, the quantity of meat um, being consumed in the developed world, um, but people sort of pay more for a smaller portion of, of a higher, higher quality product um, going forward. And, and you know, most of the developed world, if you look, you know, look around the world could probably um, survive quite nicely on a little bit less um, less meat um, and a little bit less fat. Um, where, but the develop you know the developing world that's where they've got the um, that that demand is likely to keep um, keep increasing just with the numbers um, going forward. But um, it, it producing kind of as we currently do and um, and with the restrictions of you know the environment the limitations that we've got in terms of natural resources um, across the globe, um, we will have to do things smarter. So, I mean, we may see, you know, in, in some areas, um, you know, some technologies will, will help with that um, in terms of um, genetic modification, in terms of, um, I guess, just more, more precision, less wastage of water, less wastage of fertilizers going on, um, will, will help improve yields, you know, more more monitoring of things so we know things are going wrong before they do um, those those type of things will will help um, will help but um, yeah it's it's going to be it's going to be quite a quite a challenging um, environment but you know I do think we will see re relatively high commodity prices um, going going forward um, to what we've seen over the past um, couple of decades thank you Sorry, I'll just have one more question come in about interest rates. Um, and, and sort of a little bit related to the housing market. Um, where do you see bank lending target, if you like, given that, you know, a few years ago, there was quite a push for the banks to reduce their exposure to agriculture, particularly dairy, which was over-indebted. 
Um, and obviously there's been a, your graph showed quite a high, uh, relatively large increase in housing lending and a drop in, in agricultural lending, particularly dairy. Do you see things swinging back the other way? Um, and given that probably the housing market at higher interest rates could be more risky to a bank than farms now? Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends where, where farm prices go from here and where housing prices go from here. But certainly, you know, we look like, you know, house prices are, are starting to soften um, and, and farm prices have, have well, they've sort of potentially sort of slowed down a few years back. Um, but I think, you know, we have seen banks in general sort of um, reassess where, where, where they're at. But I don't think we're seeing the similar pressures to what we saw a few years back. Um, when there was sort of that um, pressure around um, reducing dairy dairy debt, um, that's I think we're in a much more sort of sustainable, stable sort of position now in terms of 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 um, that. Um, I mean, I don't make the call for ANZ on how much we lend to what what sector. That's made um, pretty much at the board level, so I don't have an influence on that. But um, yeah, I, I think we are starting to see starting to see some you know, quite different. Um, different dynamics in the market, um, which would which, which would sort of stabilise things either where they are or, or or maybe swing back towards business and agricultural lending a little bit to a greater degree. Mm. Um, okay, um, so another our blessed beef consultant wants to know. Um, if you have any comment on future beef um, prices and returns, and, and I guess, Chris, you know, yeah. most dairy farmers are beef farmers as well. Um, in fact, they um, they would really love to get their culls away at the moment, actually, but <laughs> the works are on um, restricted intakes because of COVID, which could be in itself quite an issue going forward. Um, so any any thoughts about where beef future beef prices and returns are? Yeah, I mean I think um, globally it's it's been restricted supply globally that's really kept prices high um, as opposed to massive demand. Demand's been really, really solid. And what you know what has changed in the last few years is that you know once upon a time the US was really our only market. For, for beef or for manufacturing beef or you know, our cold cows basically. Um, whereas now we're seeing just as much demand, well actually China's buying a lot more beef um, globally than, than the US does. Um, they only buy a small portion from, from New Zealand, but it still accounts for, as you know, there is bigger market for us now as, as the US is. So we have this really good dynamics um, of, of um, in the markets now that there's a lot more competition for, the, for what we're supplying and we're not just sort of a price taker in a, in a market. So that's really helpful um, internationally. Um, the challenge at the moment is, 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 yeah, it's getting stock killed and getting that product to market is, um, is, is probably the biggest challenge. Um, I was pretty wrapped the other day when I managed to get um, get some some heifers away. Um, I the guy rang me and said I'll pick them up at six, and I was like, yeah, that's great. And, but I forgot I had to use my neighbours' yards, which involves running them down the road, and it's um, quite dark, as you all your dairy farmers will know, at um, five thirty in the morning, trying to run. And these were Angus crosses, so they were pretty black and they're pretty hard to see in the dark. But anyway, I was so wrapped, I wouldn't have cared what time you'd tell me. It's 3 a.m. I would have run them down the road because, um, you know, that space is really, really tight um, at, at the moment. And there are, you know, a lot of concerns that we could have um, space tightened up even more as sort of the COVID um, ramps through. Like we're just starting to see it and like the courier businesses are starting to really struggle to get, um, get product moved around the country. Um, I think we're quite lucky at the dairy industry, we're at you know the tail end of our season. But but certainly for the the horticulture industry and our meat processes, it is um, it's going to be really really challenging. So um, I think you know prices will stay high, but it's um, the challenges is going to be getting you know getting stock processed um, and into market and yeah. That will take a little bit out of the returns. 
Yeah, um, definitely. Um, and a uh, question from Penny, thank you for the interesting presentation. Regarding climate change predictions, do you see banks starting to factor in farm location in their lending or are they already? Um, I, I don't know about in sort of individual farm locations um, quite yet in terms of um, in terms of the risk, but you know certainly risk will be being picked up um, picked up in in general um and, and how that um how that how that plays through um i mean there's a couple of aspects in in there in terms of the location i mean there's there's properties that are at direct risk from climate events so it's things some of our coastal properties and properties that are um well there was quite a few around marnborough the other day that were underwater for quite um quite a number of days with with, with flooding and things like that so those sort of things um over time you know will be you know, will be, will be looked at um, in general. I don't think um, there's you know specific policies as such um, around it, but um, certainly in general, anything to do with sort of climate um, climate risks, um, env environmental improvement. There's a lot of focus on it um, in banks in general. Um, there's a lot of money globally. Sort of um, starting to um, come available in, in a lot of the green movements, um, and businesses in general, you know, have to, have to focus on this. So all our bigger institutional businesses have have to have policies around climate change um, and the likes. Um, and so, while you know each individual farmer aren't being asked that that those type of questions, that you know the big corporate um, corporate businesses in New Zealand are, are expected to provide that sort of information um, if, they're, if they're borrowing borrowing from banks. So yeah, there will be ongoing scrutiny, I guess, um, in, in, those, in those areas um, and, and sort of, well, at least to, at the farm level, sort of how it affects, you know, potential production and potential values of properties as well. Mm. Um, do you want to make any comments on, um trees we see the change of land use to forestry going is that do you think that will slow down or speed up or stay the same um yeah i i, I think it will depend a little bit on some of the um some of the policies um if we see policy changes around um in terms of companies being able to fully offset with with trees or not, that that could um, slow down some of the sort of the big wholesale purchases of, of farms um, that we're seeing in the complete conversion, which is mainly happening on the on the east coast, um, primarily the sort of um, a lot of the east coast of the North Island, um, but you know happening across across regions, um, and I think everyone's kind of got this desire to see. Um, more of the hill country that is erosion prone and, and the likes um, and parts of farms being planted in trees as opposed to um, the, the, the flat rolling tractor country um, go, going into trees. Um, but at the moment, you know, certainly the, if you sort of look at the financial incentives, particularly over a, um, a relatively short period of time, um, sort of up to 20 years or so, um, the, the returns from trees are certainly outperforming the majority of sheep and beef farms on in, in New Zealand. Um, so it's, you know, if, if on a pure economic returns basis, um, does depend what time period you look at, um, but there's certainly the incentive there for more land to, to go into trees. Um, but yeah, I do think we will see some policy changes which may, may tweak that. Um, and certainly if we can get more recognition for plantings um, on farms and make it easier for smaller scale plantings to, to get some recognition for the sequestration, then that could, um, you know, help us reach our sort of international greenhouse gas targets um, without, um, without having to plant entire farms and trees. So, yeah, I think we all want to go in the same direction. It's just trying to get the policies and everything aligned, which kind of incentivize the right things. Yeah, I guess um, farmers feel a bit frustrated mm. that 
um, they're being asked to reduce their emissions and can't really offset versus the um, transport sector, which are doing quite the opposite, you know, are offsetting, or some of them are offsetting 100% by taking farms out and planting trees, whereas farmers actually can't do that. So I, get, I, I feel like the policies are not really aligned across sector at the moment, and, and they certainly should be. And I'm yeah. hoping they yeah. will be. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, yeah, there certainly is a bit of that. I mean, there is nothing stopping farmers buying a, a, another bit of land and planting planting trees on it too, you know, um, and, and getting revenue from that. Um, but I think most of us are looking to what we can do within our, our farm boundary um, and, and where we can where we can make um, changes there. Um, and I guess sort of on that sort of farm change and farmland use over time. I mean, I think some of the areas that will, other areas that we can see some opportunities into is sort of more integration between our, our sheep and beef farms and our, and our dairy farms um, in terms of, you know, using sex semen and, and, and things like that to actually create um, a greater number of, of um, calves that can then be reared by the, by the beef industry and, a, you know, really valuable for, for the beef industry, which sort of reduces the need for uh, as many breeding cows as well in the in the beef industry. So, is um, you know at the moment we don't have a lot of um, a lot of contracts in our agriculture se sector at all. We kind of just rely a lot on spot markets for for a lot of things. But I think um, over time, what we really need to do is sort of develop you know more contracted supply. Um, across a, a lot of areas, which then actually reduces the risk um, of, of what we're doing. And we all kind of know where, where we're heading to a, to a greater <clears throat> degree as well. Um, and, you know, I think that's where we'll see, see things go, go eventually. All right, thanks for that, Susan. Um, we're now gonna open it up for people to ask questions directly. And, and I'm just like to uh, continue the conversation um, what happens to the value of the land if people plant trees, claim the credits, and how do the banks look at the value of land over time under trees that are claiming carbon credits? Yeah, I mean it becomes a, it becomes a real risk actually if um, if if you plant trees, you claim your credits, um, and then you um, basically. Um, if you chop those trees down, then you've got, you know, got a real risk risk sitting there. Um, and it's been it's been quite challenging for banks because there hasn't been a way to sort of, um, unlike a mortgage on a land, um, there's no way to kind of um, know who had those credits and who had the trees um, and the ownership rights. So if they ended up being in sort of in different different hands, um, it, it, it's been it's been a really tricky a really tricky one. And you can end up with land that's worth um, less, you know, that that um, is basically worth less than it would have been if, if it had, had if it has trees planted on it, um, and then the credits have been sold off, and then the trees are left there. They basically have to stay there. So you've got a bit of land that can't really be used for for anything else unless someone comes in and, and then um, repays those credits. So yeah, you've got land that's worth less than what it would have been if it was bare land, basically. Um, so yeah, it, it's not um, it, it's not an easy um, an easy easy one, and it's one that sort of the you know um, and the, you know each, each sort of I guess each each case um, has sort of been looked at it in terms of its merits, in terms of uh, lending and, and and issues around that. But it's certainly not an easy one. Mm. Yep, and I, I think that's a risk that perhaps some people are underestimating. Um, Okay, does anybody else have a question if you'd just like to either put your hand up or indicate or just ask? No? Okay, oh, well, it's, um, it, it's been an excellent presentation, Susan, and, and you know, we're in such challenging times at the moment and, and it's almost changing daily. Um, and, and I think we're probably sitting rather pretty here in New Zealand being a, a producer of commodities uh, at a time when our dollar's low and um, there is uncertainty in the world. Um, we do have increasing costs, but I think overall, um, most farmers are, are, are pretty happy, or, although a little bit nervous at the moment. And hearing you go through um, what's happening internationally, 
um, sort of gives us a better perspective on our businesses and, and, and looking forward. So from my point of view, I really appreciate um, your presentation and has found it uh, very valuable. And I would say that um, most others have, have found that too. So thank you, thank you very much uh, for your talk tonight. Unfortunately, um, we weren't able to have you um, at, our, at our conference. Um, maybe next year we might um, give it another crack. Who knows where we'll be. Um, so, so with that, yeah, I, I think I'll close and uh, yeah, much appreciated for tonight. Thanks for having me. It's been great. It's been great to be able to talk to you all, even if it is this way, not, not up in Northland. <laughs> Thank you. So we will make um, this link available on our website in a couple of weeks, if that's okay. Susan, you're happy for me to give it to the press? Yep. Because they have asked. Yep, awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. That's great. See you next week, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.